Hi, I'm Grum, and you're listening to The Escapade Show. Hello and welcome along to episode 33 of The Escapade Show. We are Stephen and Stephen, big gal and woo, and we're joined today with a very special guest, Mr. Graham Shepherd, aka Grum. Yes, hey guys. How you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Great yes. to have you here. Great to have you here. Finally. Finally did it. I know, a year later... Mm-hmm. Well, you, you guys were planning that. that for a year, weren't you? Yes, that's that's. I mean, the thing is, though, there was a couple of technicalities and why we didn't make it happen earlier. And if anything, it's probably felt the best time to kind of happen now. I think so. Yeah, a couple of small hiccups. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Took, Few, took a year to sort it. Out, mm-hmm. Yeah. Here, here we are. Now, in that time, you've moved as well, haven't you? Has that been in the last year or is that yeah. longer? Well, the last time I saw you was a year ago. That's so right, yeah. In that year, you've moved, you've got a new studio space. First of all, <coughs> how is that going? How is it helping productivity and stuff? Um, yeah, it's great. Um, I've moved, I used to live in Glasgow. Um, I've moved outside the city a little bit. Uh, got a bigger place with more room. Got a nice studio room now. Um, it's really nice, especially when I come back from touring somewhere quieter and uh, I can relax a little bit so yeah very happy at the moment chop wood out in the forest <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not quite that rural <laughs> no but it's good though it is good I think sometimes like you've got such a crazy hectic schedule yeah. touring wise um, so it must be nice to come back and kind of decompress a little yeah definitely um, I mean it's not as crazy as some people's schedules but it's enough for me um, and it, yeah it's nice to come home and chill out would you have it any busier or are you quite happy like as is um you know i it could always be busier i mean at the moment i do i don't know two or sometimes two or three shows a weekend sometimes one sometimes none you know some, there's some guys that are doing like three every weekend that sounds like it would be too much but mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> um you know i'm happy at the moment it's going well do you find yourself when you can back off a tour like readjusting in the mondays hard or have um, you got a certain routine that you switch back into like um, work mode or yeah, you know, if if I'm coming back from a trip, Monday's always a day off. Mm-hmm. Not doing any studio on Monday. Um, and I'll aim to get into the studio like Tuesday, Wednesday, and then hopefully do some music. That's a difficult thing if you're if you're doing a lot of traveling every weekend. You know, by the time you've um, recovered, got back to normal, it's time to go away again. Mm-hmm. So that can be quite rough. But it's just it's just a case of maximizing the time that you have to make sure you can um, get the most done. Mm. Uh, the, the two days I mean when you think about the week obviously there's not a lot of time in the week when you look at it that, like that way sometimes you'll start travelling on the Thursday maybe yeah exactly so and then the leaves is wet, Tuesday Wednesday Tuesday Wednesday you know. to really recalibrate and get get some stuff done you know yeah. which sometimes probably won't go to plan as well and then you're back on the road you can see how quite easily that would get quite frustrating Come do there. you find that like um, you know through how you get your gigs and like agents and stuff that are booking it do they mm. tend to try and do something that's on the route so it's like you're not having to fly from one to the other and stuff. Because I could imagine when you first kind of start, you're just mm. saying yes to everything because you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah. But then it gets to a point where it's like, does it really make sense for me to like fly to Australia then to go to Amsterdam or should I try and do it, you know, or whatever it is. So yeah. do you try and plan that route out a little bit? Yeah, we, we, try, and, we try and plan periods of time where I'll be in certain continents. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> so like, you know, we'll, we'll do the US and um, I just did... Um, two weeks in North America. I did some US and Canada, so that was a block of two weeks there. Now I'm home for three weeks or so, and I'm doing some UK ones, and then I'll go back to the US um, in January for a month. Nice. Um, and then you know we'll, we do it in blocks like that, so that it's not it's not too stressful on mm-hmm. you know, especially on on your body as well. It's it, it can be really exhausting, so we try and plan it like that so that it's manageable. Definitely. I mean, uh, do you maximise your time on like making tunes on the road? Um, I try to. Um, I um, so my my studio is the way I work is it's completely in the box if you like. It's it's just on my laptop. Mm-hmm. I just got like a really good MacBook. Um, it's got everything on there that I use all my plugins, so I can you know when I'm at home, um, I'll plug it into my speakers and a a screen Mm -hmm. and it's just like a normal computer and I'm Mm -hmm. working there and then when I go away it's the same laptop so I can just open up a project and keep working so I've I've found that that's the best way to keep things ticking over nowadays Um, and you know if you're on a plane for four hours you're bored Mm -hmm. you can just open up whatever you're working on and work on it or get some ideas done you still um, use Logic, is it? You use, yep. yeah. Still, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. I mean, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And I mean, like you, you, you just kind of like is that you've just stuck with that for years now, haven't you? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I used to use years ago. I used to use like Cubase, 
um, when I was on PC and then I moved to Logic like 10 years ago. Um, works well for me. Um, I have Ableton as well, but I just prefer Logic. Because I know you've toyed, you've toyed with, I know Ableton's kind of the door for you, but you have toyed sometimes with um, looking at Logic and the different sounds that it can bring. Mm-hmm. I, still, I mean, I still will. Like, um, there's, just, there's benefits to different doors, obviously. Mm. I find Ableton's good because it lent, it lent itself to me uh, as a DJ really easily. Mm-hmm. I could work it out fast. I used Acid Pro before that, and yep. I thought Acid Pro looked like Ableton a fair bit. Mm-hmm. I could like match the two of them. And then because of DJing, like, you know, I use Ableton, like, I'm DJing sometimes, like, you know, mm-hmm. that way you're, you're chucking a filter on or you're grabbing a loop really, really quickly. Yep. Um, whereas I've used Cubase a bit and Logic, it's a wee bit harder, or it takes a little bit more time to, to get a hold of samples and right. rather than Ableton. Yeah, or yeah. Or, like, you know, I chuck know. a loop in or do things on the fly. So that's mm-hmm. why I've stuck to Ableton. But I've heard a lot about using Ableton to build ideas and then mix and master in Logic because mm-hmm. it's it's solely for music production, whereas Ableton was never built just for music production. So I think the engine and Logic's slightly better, potentially. Slightly I've heard that, that opinion. Um, you know, know. It, there's a warmth to Logic. I certainly think I can hear it. Uh, we done a test once, uh, me and Jack, and it was a, like a project on Ableton, a project on Logic, just mm. to see what the differences were, you know? Mm-hmm. And it, I definitely think there was a, a warmth going on. With, came out slightly different, uh, did just, it? Yeah. Just slightly, obviously the wood slightly. I, th- I, think it, I think part of the difference that's perceived is because of the, the plugins that they come with, and Ableton's ones are coded a little bit, you know, they're a bit different to mm. Logic. So if you just use the stock plugins, I, I feel like you get a slightly different result. Mm. Um, mm. But I don't know, they're both good. I feel like Ableton is, it, it feels a little bit like you're on a track like on a train track or something mm. you're going along whereas to me logic feels like a blank canvas okay it's just the way that's it's cool. just the way i see it but um that's why i like working in it well it works for you so talk us a wee bit through your process how do you get into the mind frame because i think one of the things we've been talking about off camera mm. um it's like with a noisy world that we now live in as well it's like it's, it's hard to make a decision never mind get into the headspace to to make music so how do you what's your process in getting ready to make some music um, well, I think the best thing you can do is um, try and get everything, all the, all the little jobs that you have to do, get them signed off, get them all done out of the way so that you can sort of detach from the world a little bit. I think that's, that's for me anyway, that's when I come up with my best ideas, when I can fo- uh, focus on making one track for like six hours, you know, the time just goes past like that and you come up with an idea that's really good and that's the best way to... Um, really focus on working on music I think um, you know turn your phone off <laughs> no interruptions and just get into it it's interesting because everyone's got a different process of how, how, how they do it what's mm. important though is, is the switch off though like yeah. getting out of reality and getting into the I don't know that the, the creative zone that is you know yeah. you don't know what can happen when, when, when you get out of you know that constantly looking at your phone or, or whatever you know being you distracted can, you can go yeah. away because you're inspiration just can just strike yeah, a mistake true. can strike something and yeah you have to uh, capitalize on that and uh-huh. and then use that to turn it into something um i think it's i think it's good to have a space where you can get away as well like your studio could should maybe be a just a studio you know obviously if, if you have to have in your bedroom that's i mean i used to do that as well it's one thing but if you can get a room where you can go away shut the door and turn off the world mm-hmm. then i think that's a good way to come up with ideas. What's that allocated time that you know what you're going in for? Yeah. You know, if it's in the bedroom, you can just easily get distracted, you know, but again, mm. as you say, you might not have that luxury yet, so it's like you have to work with what you've got, but mm. it's an interesting point, detaching it. You know, it's like having that home office, you're like, ah, well, the telly's just there, I got a wee game of Xbox, you know mm. what I mean? Well, a couple of wee Call of Duty. It's always risky setting up a console in a studio, eh? Yeah, like, don't do that. Or a TV. <laughs> <laughs> Never done that, but I mean, you can see why. We're be. all gamers here as well, so. Yeah. You know when to switch on the gaming hat and, uh, yeah. you know, the production yeah. one, you know, you not have, at the yeah, same time. You have, you, have to be, you have to be quite strict on yourself and uh, mm-hmm. you have to be quite motivated and say, like, I'm doing this. Um, yeah. Do you... Uh, are you uh, kind of the person that, that finishes one project and then goes to the next, or do you have a few kind of plates spinning at once? Um, I usually have a few on, on the go at once. I find that's the best way I work. Um, and, I mean, that's why I like working on albums, because you can allocate a, a big bunch of time and do all these different tracks and do a bit on one, do a bit on the other, and it builds up into this sort of 
um, what was it? You know, it's like you're making a little world of music, mm-hmm. a body <laughs> um, of music. Yeah, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's, I think that's a good way to work. Um, and you know, if you're working on one track, you might you might figure something out on that one, which you can use on another. And suddenly, you've got all these things in your head, like, oh, that sample was good for this, or you know, that kick drum was good. And I'll use that on this, and then you're suddenly you're getting lots done. Mm-hmm. That's, I think that's the best way. That's pretty cool. I mean, uh, artists. We were talking about that the other day or this morning. I don't know what, whatever it was. Um, and you were just saying like, you know, uh, albums are like what they're career defining for artists. Like yeah. going, like, it's such a big project. You remember mm-hmm. like big artists, big bands, you remember their albums. Yeah. So it's like, you know, totally makes sense immersing yourself in that body yeah. of work, you know, yeah. rather than churning out singles. You know. Absolutely. The thing is as well, so if one thing I noticed like from yourself, pretty early on, you seem to have done an album. Mm. Like when you kind of first just broke through sort of first two, three years, you were already onto an album. So what inspired that and what, what made you think, do you know what, I'm going to go down that route because there might be other people that have been releasing for 10 years but thought, no, I'm, it's not ready for an album yet. Mm-hmm. What kind of made you ready? And I think that has definitely been a big part in helping you stand out. Um, yeah, well, so the, the, my first album, uh, Heartbeats, um, so that came out 2010. Um, and um, I mean, back then it was the way things worked in music were very different to now. It's changed like so much in the last nine, 10 years. Um, and so, so, so back then I was working with um, Glasgow Underground, uh, Kevin Mackay, who did uh, Milo, uh, Linus Loves. Um, and he wanted to do, um, he sort of found me and he wanted to do, you know, this was the way, the process he knew that worked and he wanted to do something similar. And, um, you know, I was like, sure, you know, I'll do an album. That sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it just seemed like back back then that was a good way to, to do things because mm-hmm. uh, especially with the music I was making then it was more like disco electro kind of crossover you know it was you know maybe it had a potential to, to chart and things like that so it made sense to do an album with that sort of music that's very cool because at the time as well you were like at, you know so you were doing like remixes for like Goldfrap and mm. Lady Gaga and all that so how did some of those things yeah. come about and was it, surely that must have been quite surreal even at the time so early on yeah I mean yeah it was it's funny. It was there's, I mean, you know, you, there's there's different pastors at different artists, and I was quite lucky then. And suddenly, you know, suddenly I was getting all these things, and it was lots of things were happening. And I was touring and doing all these remixes, um, and it was really cool. You know, I, I, I think I didn't realize how lucky I was at the time to begin to do those. Um, and it was it was really fun actually to sort of play about with those tracks. <laughs> yeah, be a part of that. Yeah. I mean, you can see it though, like like the evolution. So, right, it's definitely something I want to delve into here. You're saying mm. that the industry's changed a lot over the last 10 years. Mm. So how has it changed in your mind? What what are the kind of key differences now for people to either avoid or look out for? Well, I mean, I, th- I think the main way it's changed is the way that um, artists are marketed or market themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, when, I, when I started... Um, Facebook was like an afterthought. Um, mm-hmm. And in fact, at the very, very start, it was, I don't even think Facebook was a much of a deal. It was like MySpace. Um, and I, the way I started was um, I kind of decided to myself, I want to, I want to, I want to make, make a career in music really. I want to try and do this. And I ended up spending time after work every night, work, just working on music weekends, all the, all the spare time I had, I was like, I'm going to do this. Let's, you know, get a bunch of music together. And then I was like, I used MySpace to set up a page and then I sent the music to different artists that I liked. Um, Brilliant. And some of them replied. Um, and then that led to um, working with Glasgow Underground. But anyway, um, to get back to the question, um, the, the way it's marketed has changed because um, with the first album, we announced the album on Facebook as like an afterthought. It, you know, social media was not, it, it didn't really matter. The, Not what it is now. The, the main way to, to sell your music was to get in the magazines, get on Radio 1, mm. um, all the traditional um, media paths. Um, and, uh, you know, that was that was the, the focus. And if we didn't get those targets, then it was a big problem. <laughs> you yeah. know? Whereas, you know, nowadays we know how it works. It's, um, it, it's very about your stats, your numbers, your image. I mean, image wasn't really such a thing back then. You know, if you look on somebody's Facebook now, it's a lot of them are very 
professionally curated and they look cool. They look yeah. There's there's a there's definitely a, a, a you know they aim to look cool and all that kind of thing and it's you know fair enough. <laughs> Do you think the music suffers because of that? Um, I don't know. I mean, you hear all kinds of stories about people who you know they spend more money on their marketing than on the, you know, their music and studio and things like that, or they spend more time taking pictures of themselves than working on music and. Um, I don't know. Everybody has a different way of doing things, but uh, I see. When I started out, it was because it, you know I was doing this blog electro stuff, uh, disco electro blog, and it was so different. Um, it was all about the music, to be honest. Um, and it was there was lots of small independent blogs, and you could send your music to them, and they, if they liked it, they would upload it, and suddenly you know thousands of people around the world were um, listening to your music. Um, and I liked that. It was just all purely music. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. we had some, you know, you had like your press pictures and things, but the main focus was music. But nowadays it's, it's the whole package. Um, I guess it's because it's just so disposable now as well. There's so many people out there, you mm -hmm. know, churning it out and kind of have that ability. And there's a lot less musicianship. Yeah. If you like, actually, that's one thing uh, John Morales said on uh, the the Go Radio interview I done with him, and you know he's a kind of house and disco legend from the Bronx. You know what mm. I mean? And uh, that's one thing he's like, you know, he had this pure caramel voice, and uh, and he was just talking about how like you know not many people are musicians now. Yeah. So it's like that, well, I, I don't, that makes sense as I well. I don't think there are any more musicians in the world than there were 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's just more people. It's become so much easier to get into it. Mm -hmm. Like even. Before you know, before um, it was mainly software and it was hardware, the barrier to entry was so high. Like you would have had to invest ten, twenty grand in equipment, and mm. to do that, you'd have to really love it and really <laughs> yeah. want to do it. Yeah. Mm. Whereas now you can, you know, people just download Ableton from somewhere and cracks off. Download you know, a template, maybe. maybe. Maybe they'll come up with something good, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> this is and it. access to uh, templates for music as well. Now that's a mm. market in itself. Like, is it really? Is that, yeah, is yeah. That, so you can go on. To Google or whatever site and, and download a template in a certain genre. Change, I mean, I've, change some of the notes. Well, that's it. <laughs> but people have released full on tracks from templates, and hmm. there's, I mean, some have got, got through, but others have been pulled up. There's been this big ho uh, hurrah about, you know, that, well, that's just a template you've released there, and it's wow. been signed on X label. And I've seen like the scandals of that happening as an after effect mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm you know that going on it's mad hmm. it's, I mean it's, it also comes back to sampling I think before you're in music production a lot of people find the word sampling quite a dirty word and that's mm. one of the things I was saying like you know, sort of my recent hobby of the last year is like finding samples or ones that I think could be or famous samples from tracks yeah. and everything well, everything you've ever heard is sampled I mean I could actually show you ones that will blow your minds even from like Daft Punk yeah. where they've taken the exact riff and all they've done is just add their own lyrics or add a kick drum I've heard the, of these yeah honestly well, it's like it's such a great well, that's, area isn't it? That's, I mean that's the foundation of, of electronic music and dance music was sampling I mean Same it used to be yeah. that used to be it was you know a lot of it was constructed just from samples of other tracks um, I think it's quite it's quite funny nowadays. I mean, there's people get into it who are younger and they maybe don't realize that. Mm -hmm. And then you see you see comments who are like, "Hey, this is this song." I'm like, yeah, it's a sample. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. But that that's all music, but isn't it? But but the the thing that always yeah it is. But the the thing I always liked about dance music was um, people you would use samples in interesting ways um, and use it in a creative way. And mm -hmm. I think I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah, they actually add more to it. Yeah, you know, they they give it give it its own lease of life. As yeah, opposed like, to just copying, you know. Yeah. If, you, if you look at like Milo's album, that was, I think, a lot of that was samples. And, yeah. Um, but he he would like mash different things together and use them in creative ways, um, and I, I think that's really cool. It's all fair game, really, isn't it? And that's yeah. it. And, and considering the amount of sampling, how does it stand like legally with that? Because all, there always has been like well, the I amount mean, of stuff out for just me now. when I think about it. I still can't really work out because you hear on one hand it's it's totally you know illegal mm. it's got copyright it's this that and the other and then on the other hand there's so much of it going on yeah well i mean we see people that maybe take a, a sample especially now we certainly won't name any names because we, we you know everyone does a, a, a bit of it mm. but it's like they'll take a really prominent sample from a song and then just like call their tune something else right and it's like or they might even use a word from the original name but it's like oh the original mix by whoever and you're like but that is a 
as I told you, you, wonder, you wonder whether it's been cleared or whether they're just doing it because well, there's that amount of music just hopefully we'll get away with it yeah it's a question yeah. we actually get asked a lot here at the studio as well so mm-hmm. maybe well, you could shed some light on it yeah it's, it's kind of I think it's kind of a grey area especially with music that's just going up on Beatport you know it's just thrown up there on, on a label like I mean they're probably not going to get in trouble for it but um, in terms of doing it the prop, you know the, the right way um, it, it's not really it, it can be quite in my experience it's not too difficult to use samples um, you get the odd one that are just like no if you, when you try and clear out the labels like no the publishers like no yeah. but generally you can come to an agreement sometimes they want a large percentage of um, the credit on the track which sometimes you just have to give away but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's ways of doing it um, properly um, for example um, so on my album, uh, the, the new album, Deep State, there's a track called The Ascent, which has a sample of um, uh, Don't Fear the Reaper, you know, the classic 70s rock track. Mm-hmm. Um, and we we cleared the sample with the publisher, um, and then we got the actual sample replayed. Um, and that avoids you having to clear the actual, actual sample from mm-hmm. the master track. Um, and that's a legitimate way of doing it that's a lot easier. In that sense, do, you, do they still get cut into the deal that way? Yeah, everybody, Although it's yeah. been replayed? Yeah, I mean... I think, because of the lyrics? I or? think we actually had to give 100% for that one to them as the writer. So, right. Um, you know, mm. probably won't make many royalties from that track, but it's, mm-hmm. it's but a way it's of there. getting the track out there. You know, it's... It's not about that sometimes, exactly. No, exactly. Uh, yeah. And it's, you know, if the thing is as well, with these uh, stories I've heard, if the track or the thing that you've done, if it's that creative and that good, then they're going to want to release it, Mm -hmm. re-release it. I mean, if there's value in what you've done with it, then why shouldn't there be a deal be made? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's exactly, I mean, some, some people are more precious about it than others, but I think, I think it's, you know, if somebody sampled me, I'd be very interested. You know, mm, I'd love to totally, hear it. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. Good way of looking at it. It's a way of revitalising an old track as well. Let's say it has been out of the market for thirty years. It's like, why mm. wouldn't you? But again, then maybe let's say it's a track of theirs that they hate, and they're like, no, I don't want that piece of it. So, well, that leads us on then. So, Deep State new album. Mm. Tell us a wee bit about the concept then, because it's been in the pipeline for a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, yeah, now yeah. it's finally out. Have listened to it. Love it. It's uh, nice and deep and dark and quite the journey. Mm. Um, artwork, everything cool. So tell us first about the name and the, the concept behind it. Sure. Um, well, you know, deep state is a phrase that you might have heard in, in the news or <laughs> if you watch anything about politics or whatever. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I'd heard it being <laughs> spoken about a lot, especially with um, what was happening in the US. And um, I was like, you know, deep state, that, you know, that could be pretty cool for an album. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and uh, but, I don't know, it's just a bold phrase, isn't it? And um, that kind of defined how the album went, you know. It, it chose a name like a couple of months into um, writing it and that sort of decided its path and decided the artwork and things, you know. It's, it was, you know, it's got a certain look about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, I mean, there, there wasn't really a, an overarching concept behind it, but... Um, a few of the tracks I'd made are going, they're going towards towards this kind of, it's, you know, I was trying to look at like trans progressive and trans when it was sort of starting out in the nineties, and I've I've sort of been inspired by that quite a lot. Um, at the time, it was like old Sasha mixes, you know, the old Oakenfold stuff, and that like deep like mm-hmm. hypnotic sound, and I definitely wanted to capture some of that for the album. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, that, you definitely can hear it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what a golden time for music, though. Like, yeah. you know, the oak and fold mixes and stuff like that. Like, well, that, well that's, that was when I got into wanting to produce music in the first place. So I, it's kind of, you know, I've come for a full circle in a way. Mm. Um, back, back then, um, you know, 99, 2000, I was 13, 14. And the, the big thing at the time was trance. Um, and it was Ferry Corston. He was one of my favourites. Mm. <laughs> um, still is. Um, and uh, you know I've kind of gone full circle and gone, gone back to that a little bit mm. definitely um, considering what you were making before as well uh, yeah. you know you were more into I guess a kind of justice type sound and yeah. 
and now you're going back to the kind of transfer stuff, but with all yeah. of that knowledge and backing behind it, which right. is which is super cool. Yeah. I love that era though because that's when like, all the genres were just mashed together. Mm. And then when like Beatha was all kicking off, you had Carol Cox hanging about with Oak and Fold, hanging about with Judge Jules, they were all floating around doing similar stuff and even like, you know, Sven Vath and yeah. Richie Horton were all dabbling in different bits and then Paul yeah. Van Dyke, like they all they went their separate ways, but they were all in this mix mash of just amazing dance music. Dance music, right, mind, yeah. Which is yeah. so cool. Well, that's, was, that's what it is from. And it was, yeah, and I mean, at that time, it wasn't so fragmented. And it was and just, so, yeah, yeah. you know, you yeah. could get a lineup with all of them on it yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Which sounds awesome. And for <laughs> me, I always still champion that. I was championing that down the studio. There's, mm-hmm. there's no snobbery here. Yeah. And there shouldn't be. Do you yeah. know what I mean? There's yeah. like, these days, it's what box are you in? Right, exactly. So, you know, what genre is that? And and we've been eaten up by that. You know, totally. just because the scene tells you to be like that or like, you know, sometimes mm. you're like, and you're like, why why is it so, you know, boxy? You know, because <laughs> even that's what I was saying to you, like, you know, you know, out with the studio, I'm, I'm listening to every genre of music and it's like, you know, half the time I find myself playing something, I go, I really want to DJ this stuff out. <coughs> why am I not? You know mm. what I mean? And it's like, but then then there's other times where you can, and it's just it really depends on what you're doing. But I guess it's interesting. that might come full circle again, though, as well, because Maybe, music yeah. does where everything is just. Whew. Well, that was that was also what was good about you know that 2008 2009 era when I was doing you know the old the first album, that was that was like a real mashup of stuff then, and, and it was like, you know, if you listen to a Justice set from then, they play all kinds of stuff, mm. um, and I. You know, and then it, it, it went totally the other the other way mm. for the next few years. Uh, maybe it'll come back. That's yeah. what a DJ should be, though, is like showcasing your musical knowledge and taking people on a journey, and not just yeah. coming out and doing one style. We were, we were just talking about that in the car. Like mm-hmm. the you know the thing I like is there's DJs that mix up like trance, techno, progressive, house, deep house. Like you don't have to just look at a certain genre on Beatport. <laughs> you, mm-hmm. can, you can play tunes from all different genres. Um, mm-hmm. But nowadays, I think it's the way that you have to market music. It's like you have to fit yourself in this very small box to be marketable. And it's, it, I think the music suffers a bit. It does. And it's almost like that's now a strategy. Like you yeah. have to nail one thing to get through the door. And then once you've nailed that one thing, you can splinter off and educate a bit. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Just yeah. like nail the techno sound first and then you can go and play trance and house in your set. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? You're yeah, seeing yeah. that kind of path mm-hmm. rather than going in and, and being something why not, that plays why not, why not just be an artist and do what you like? I and have good music and bad music. Well, creative I mean? control. Two genres. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it. It's just having the creative control and putting out what, it, like that's what an artist should be. They shouldn't be limited. They should be able to do what they want. Well, yeah. You, you, you know, you should be an artist and musician, not a marketing executive. Mm-hmm. Yourself. So it's obviously different <laughs> if you're like, you know, there's one thing like maybe making like house, progressive, trance, techno, all that, or like coming out with a rock tune. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's <laughs> obviously that, that can be a little bit. Yeah, there, there's <laughs> definitely there are exceptions to the rule, but when mm. it maybe comes to dance music, it should all be really under the one umbrella. But I mean, I suppose I understand this like anything over time, subgenres form. Yeah. And then it's kind of like, oh, they're not playing enough of this at those events right we'll throw our own events and that's how mm. it gets fragmented over yeah, time yeah, yeah. till you're doing Polish Gabba you know and, I love that and, and, yeah, that's <laughs> you know in some in some so uh, the next big thing you know, yeah. do you know what I mean it's like uh, just fractions fractions until it just you know it's, it's yeah. so yeah. many different things it's, yeah it's, it's just cycles in it it goes between mm. Um, being fragmented and then it comes all back together in a big mashup of different, you know, it's just the way it goes. Speaking of genres, right, where do you think the, the trans scene's at just now? Do you think it's, I mean, you're involved in the kind of more progressive side, mm. which I love. Mm. I love in Juno Beats and it really mega. I think, I think it's so fresh. Yeah. What do you think of the scene in general? Just, um, I don't know. Yeah, like you say, I'm not super in, I'm not super involved in the, like, it's a bit fragmented, like, like we were saying, it's kind of, kind of split in two. There's like the faster stuff. You know, like one th- the one three eight thing, um, and then there's like Anjuna beats. I think that's the, mm-hmm. the two the two sides two sides. Yeah. Um, but they yeah they don't seem to meet in the middle very much. Like there's no one three. Is there one three two tracks? <laughs> I know there used to be. One three five. Oh, you're making a couple. You've <laughs> got a couple. I, I, I've got a few of those. I mean, it's just funny you say that. There used to be a lot of meet in the middle tunes mm. like Marcel Woods, Marco V stuff. Yeah, the kind of techie. That was tech, the techno, yeah. but. Well, a lot of techno is that now. Actually, to be fair, it's but trance. getting harder and faster, isn't mm. it? Techno and a lot of trance now is going the hard dancey route. Right. Yeah. You know, like um, um, David Rust and well, actually, all that. They're kind of harder. Actually, just saying that um, above and beyond at the weekend. Uh, so I did warehouse project in, in Manchester, and above and beyond, they played some of their old stuff. They did some classics. They did they played the Madonna remix. Right. Um, at like I don't know what speed it is. One three 
something. <laughs> <laughs> it's up there. It's yeah. up there. <laughs> but, you know, it was interesting to hear them do that. Like, mm. the last half hour of their set was one, three, five ish or something, you know. Mm. Gregor so, was there. Gregor was, was there. He? Yeah, he loved it. I think he said that's the best set he's seen from them in years. And mm. he, he goes to a lot of their sets. Okay. Yeah, but, they're, but they're masters of the, the, prog- the, the progression. You know, right. from the Anjuna Deep stuff that they'll do if an unextended an set right through to maybe that kind of stuff, which I love again. It's DJs, isn't it? It's DJing through the yeah. styles, through the spectrum. Well, I mean, they're also masters of reinventing themselves. You know, they they changed, they slowed their stuff down for the, uh, you know, when that happened a few years ago. Um, mm. So maybe they're, maybe they're going to do more of that now. I don't know. Mm. Definitely lots to learn from people like those guys because the thing is, in when music is so disposable now, and there's so many acts out there it's like how do you keep yourself relevant how do mm. you keep it going and with a sort of dip in trance scene that you know it's kind of up and down it's maybe massive in other places less as much in Britain these days it's kind of coming back again through the techno side of stuff mm-hmm. so it's like it's interesting to see how guys like that really have remained kind of crucial acts in the scene well I think there's an interesting point there especially about the UK um, and I was talking about this with um, Will Will Atkinson yep um, like if you look at um, how how music is sold here and how our acts get big, a lot of it is through the uh, BBC, uh, BBC Radio. Yeah. Um, and um, if you look at their radio, sh- specialist radio shows, I mean, it's all house and techno now. There's no, um, mm-hmm. there's no, there's no trance show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even though it's, you have huge events with thousands of people every week all over the UK. I mean, it's kind of ignored. So. Um, I, I probably probably contributes to why mm. it isn't as th- big with younger people. I think Pete Tong gets cl- this close to techno trance, right? Or genre mm. talk, talking genres here again, but he has played some trancey type mm. bits on the, on his shows, and I think that's maybe the closest it's getting. Yeah. It's still slow. It's still it's, yeah. It's fit, very, I mean, it's, your stuff would fit on those shows though for sure because it's mm. it's that it's you know more universal, I'd say, than the yeah. banging. Mm-hmm heavy duty trans stuff yeah. do you know what I mean that's maybe Eddie yeah. Halloway remember the Eddie Halloway show Thursday nights so yeah, yeah. Fergie and Aye, and that, they, they, yeah. those days is when I really I mean Radio 1 was on fire those those times you know mm. do you do you think though that's bec- because the quality of the music still there I, I just don't know if the quality is as high as it once was and that's maybe just me coming from a biased standpoint but I think mm. that it's like it should be down to the music and is there enough trance artists that spring to your mind that are fresh that are new that have got some buzzing stuff going on mm-hmm. or is that more because the buzz is more in house and techno um well i, I don't know i just think uh, everything should be represented in a way because that's what they're meant to do all, all spectrums yeah i suppose yeah. i mean that's what the bbc is there for the, well, the, the license. are we referring here to uh, uh sir askew's uh, email <laughs> uh the <laughs> <laughs> that he said to BBC which was very that was, bold that was a good one yeah. have they had a reply do you know uh, probably not right? probably not would you, probably would you not. reply to that <laughs> I mean, how do you reply to that I mean I would because I think that's cool but that's me and I'm mental yeah. um, but I think you know straight away though he identified some great points in that email and he done it in such a comedic way yeah. so surely you've got to have a bit of a laugh at that and go do you know what he's got a fair point Yeah. because yeah. um, it's right in what you're saying and there's nothing against representing it that I'm just maybe trying to know from their standpoint are they getting enough good new fresh trance music that yeah. they can go oh this is going to fit in but yeah, again not, sh- should yeah. they be fitting into that box but maybe not they might not be well, and that's why if you remember uh, John Peel you know back in the day I mean he would play all sorts of stuff on his show some of it was not good mm. <laughs> but, he, but he would play all but he represented but he, he would play like all different kinds of music that wasn't um, you know maybe wasn't really marketed didn't mm. have that support behind it from like independent labels and um, I think music suffers when that kind of stuff yeah. is buried and nobody hears it you know it'd be good to hear a broad spectrum for sure no uh, that's a total fair point I mean there's a lot going on for Grime there's a lot of BBC One Extra they're covering all sorts of stuff yeah. down yeah. in London you mm-hmm. know and you know, that's a fair point. It's just yeah. keeping up to date with all the fresh stuff that, that's that's kind of coming because, again, unfortunately, it's the music business. Yeah. And it's like right now, trance events, I think, are suffering a little bit in the UK compared. Mm. Um, certainly not abroad, and there's obviously massive demand for it, mm. but it's kind of like even the BBC and other radio stations, they just jump on the trends of what's working because it's became so much more business orientated now. True, yeah. And again, going back to it, it's not really about the music, it's about the image and how yeah. cool you look. 
and the music. Yeah. So it's like what's it business business techno? This is it <laughs> totally. And I've been hearing that. I know. I know Willie Daniels certainly. He's got a big gripe with the whole melodic techno thing at the moment and we need to get him on the but show he also, he also likes it though as well he does I think he's just a big wind up merchant aye uh, but I've seen him what, what uh, does he not like about it well he put a post the other day there and somebody was saying to be honest mate I, I really quite like the melodic techno and he's like aye you mean business techno <laughs> and he's saying aye you mean tech trance of 2008 mate <laughs> but see like in me it's not the same as the tech trance back then it's not it's different hmm. I understand what he's saying. I think he's at, he's, he's also yeah, stirring, he's stirring up. Pot, yeah. that's, that's what social media is for. So you can have a laugh and you know do that. Wind kind of people that right funny. Up. You, know, you can laugh along. But it's interesting <laughs> because it is it has having an effect, and that's a, a great point. The BBC is definitely the recognised platform for people like to break through. Or right. That's where you hope you're going to get your music played yeah. more than anywhere. Yeah. So they do dictate a lot of what you're going to hear. It's, mm. Yeah, it's changed up a little bit recently in the last few years. Like you can still make a career out of you know music without getting BBC support but you know it'd mm. be nice <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> where, I mean where do you see then trance really booming because obviously at the moment you, I mean you're touring everywhere I mean mm. you know I, I watch your Instagram and see your stuff you know and um, not in a creepy way but um, you know and like I, I see you popping up doing sets all over the place so where, where do you find you get a real massive reception and where you're like wow this feels like 2011 in the UK or something yeah. you know um I mean, in the U.S. is where I tour. Well, the U.S. and Canada is where I tour the most at the moment. Um, and there, you know, the biggest events I play are generally there. Um, especially, you know, my own events with the album tour and things. Um, so that's that's where it's good at the moment, I would say. Um, I don't know where else. Um, I mean, Argentina has always, it's always been Huge. big there. Yeah. It's like, you know, EDM never happened there, so it was just mm. always... Trance and techno is big there, so I just hope it doesn't hit them. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I think they've avoided it. Luckily, they've missed it. It's too far yeah. away. Did I get there? Yeah, but, uh, Argentina has, has always been really kicking off, mm. hasn't it? It's like it's like um, I'd be in the nineties there. Yeah, yeah. You know it's, it's still like yeah, still like that. Some buzz, but you also hear quite a, a few political things from the Argentinians, though. Yeah. Mm. from nights and you things say anything, you'll be silenced. And, uh, you know what I mean I don't want to be silenced you know what I mean <laughs> some Argentinian bloke uh, but you know you know you see here so, I mean that that is interesting to see so your own shows then mm. because you've got concepts coming you've got things coming we're mega interested definitely want to make it along to some of these things mm -hmm. so tell us a wee bit about what's happening with Deep State yeah well um, coming up actually we've got um, well, it's just on Juno Beats night, but I'm playing in Glasgow on Saturday. Saturday, yeah, we'll yeah. be there. Yeah, we'll yeah, be there. That's SWG three. Um, so that's the first thing coming up. Um, but then after that, we've got some. Um, we're going to do some deep state events. Uh, we we did one in London um, in November. That was really good. That was like the album launch party. Um, that was that was really fun. Um, and what yeah, was the venue there? It was. Uh, it's called Steelyard. Oh, or the, the still yard, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, that just sounds cool, doesn't it? Yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it was does. a really, really nice venue. It's kind of underneath some old arches. Nice. Um, like our favourite venue, <laughs> the arches. <laughs> yep. Rest bring in peace. Back, yep, bring yep, it yep. Back, bring yeah. it back. Um, and we're going to do. We've got. We just announced uh, Manchester for next uh, February or March. I think it is. Nice. Um, and then coming up, we're going to. We're looking at doing some other things in the summer as well. Um, can't see anything yet, but. Um, should be some good things. Amazing. Mm. What a name, Deep State. I like that a lot for like events as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Events. And, and events is really where you can put your mark on the concepts as to like artists you want to book and yeah. like direction Visuals. you want to see. Like maybe there's like a kind of techno artist you love and you're like, he'll work great at the start and then I'll come on and then such and such will finish yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. It's cool, man. That's that's what we did in London. Um, so, we're, you know, we're trying to build a little stable of artists. So um, there's a guy called Kane. Uh, he's from L.A., He's doing some. Well, he's not really progressive, but he's does. He's kind of techno progressive. Like I don't know. He's he's doing his own thing. I, I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. um, so he's involved. Um, and there's uh, Dylan as well. He's from he's from the UK. Um, he's doing really nice, sort of deeper prog stuff. So a few people. Cool. There's a mm. Dylan. Um, is it Jeremy Orlander? Has alias right. Dylan? 
Yeah, I think. It's, it's a different. Right? Spe- it's a different spelling. Right. Okay. <laughs> I know. J- Jeremy uh, Orlando stuff's great. Yeah. Yeah. He's really good. He's amazing. Mm. You. You, put, mean, you yeah. put me on to him, didn't you? Yeah. No, I think you put me on to him. Oh, right. Okay. Aye. Uh, Dylan, no, I think that's an alias of his. Mm. I thought that's who you meant first. Right. Right. Different, different dark, one. Dark, nice Aye, darkness. Dark, uh, nice darkness. Uh, nice darkness. Just whatever that uh, means. No, you know what I'm talking about, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. I remember. I say. I remember. No, mm. Jeremy Landers uh, was one that you've got me into from back then because he's always had that kind of pro- progressive style. Right up our street. Again, just so much of it's defined into a box. It's kind of, I love it all, man. Just yeah. dance music. Just start using dance music. Yeah. That's it. That's what it starts now. That's it. But that's the kind of things that you can showcase. So is there going to be a label and stuff coming? Are we allowed to talk about any of that? Is... Um, yeah, yeah. So we're going to start a label in January. Um, first release. Exclusive information yep. now. Exclusive. <laughs> Um, so first release is actually from Kane, who we we're just talking about. Excellent. Um, two tracks, two three tracks, tracks, EP, two tracks. Yeah, okay. and then we're, we've got February. You know, we're going to do one a month basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would one be, a month. Excellent. Yeah, going to you know we're, the aim is good quality. Not you know we're not just going to put loads of music out and just hope that it does something. We're just everyone is going to be good music that I love and. Well, Excellent. Not to put anybody in the spot, but I'm sure there's a couple of wee projects you could uh, send uh, James away and send, see. I'll send you some over. Yeah, send over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's just not what you know. It's who you know. Trying, right to, right? Trying, <laughs> trying to blackmail me into this. <laughs> <on the podcast. laughs> just, we'll, we'll just go quickly live, Greg. <laughs> no, I mean it's like that. That's the thing, though. It's like the, I love the sort of network in Scotland hmm. because you know now we've had we've had techno guys on we've had trance legends on you know hard style people mm. and it's like for us it is we're just trying to champion what's going on in scotland man because it's a beautiful small wee country that's very talented yeah and i think we give ourselves a hard time very very you know, we're very good at that you know i suppose so yeah it's, it's good to you know it's good to have a bit of a community thing going on because mm-hmm. it can be quite um isolating Absolutely. Yeah, that's, you know. that's a good word for it isolating mm. um, and like the right. podcast and what we're doing is, is really about that collective really and yeah, like you know, for 5 million people there's quite a lot of good musicians yeah we do quite well artists for a wee country yeah from simple minds to grum do you know what I mean it's like <laughs> yeah I think we're going to need uh, I think we're going to physically need to pin Will down to get him on yeah, because it's like, been it's bun- bundle them in a van and get them here we've, uh-huh. got, we've got vans yeah. we do have vans <laughs> Yeah. So, so we could we there could just grab him. Yeah. Will Will's hilarious. I mean, he's obviously one that's championing the scene in a different side. You know, he's mm. probably the other side of the spectrum to yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, you're the kind of slower. But at the same stuff. time, he's got whole set, which, which is yeah. great stuff. Which is it shows you how diverse and you know talented Will is. You yeah. know, you know, Will, but Will's, uh, brilliant. It's great to see what he's doing, and I love this some of the sort of gimmicky stuff he plays into. You know, like showing up at that thing with the kilt and all that. I mean, he really. <laughs> He really is champion in Scotland in a good way. Yeah. And it's uh, good to see. Yeah, he's doing his own thing. It's, uh, Have you been on fun. any shows with Will recently? Um, I can't remember. Probably. <laughs> That's the thing. You do that many now. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's all over There's the place. We, we did um, Tomorrowland. He did he did a whole set, um, set on the Anjuna stage. That was fun. Um, yeah. He's definitely, I mean, maybe a wee yo set for the, for the label, maybe. You know, Pos- yeah, a, yeah, possibly. That's that'd a be, potential. Cool. Yeah. Look at there. I'm trying to link it all up. Yeah. You know what that's I mean? It. Doing your job, mate. Try to be the glue. Yeah. We'll, we'll get, we'll get well on a wee stream there now. <laughs> so it's a wee bit on stu- the studio stuff again, because mm-hmm. uh, I know a lot of our listeners love studio geeking out, okay. you know, like, yep. so if you could name a couple of VSTs you're loving or maybe your go tos for some of the stuff like your leads or plucks or whatever. Sure. Um, because I know the guys would jump at, jump at that. They love like, a tip. Uh, yeah. They love a wee tip. Well, um, my sort of plug-in setup is quite straightforward. I, I just try and keep ones that I really love using, rather than having like a million to choose from. I think I think you can have too much choice. Um, so probably my f- some of my favourite ones are um, TAL plugins, um, and they do a it's like a Juno emulator mm-hmm. um, called Juno. <laughs> Um, the Juno Uno. Juno Uno, <laughs> yeah. Um, and they do one that's based on the 101 um, baseline synth as well. And they're both really nice, um, simple synths that are, I can come up with ideas in them quickly. Um, and they've got, you know, they're from the 80s, so they've got a certain sound to them as well, which suits my music. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, those two are really good. Um, and also the Yuhi um, Repro. These all sound really weird, don't they? Like, yeah, no, so it's weird saying these out loud. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but it's 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 based on the Prophet, um, which is a really nice, punchy 
punchy synth. It's good for basses and leads and things. So cool. Those, there we yeah. go. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. What Check about um, like kind of processing plugins? Any favourites you use? Um, yeah. Well, I recently got into you know, Plugin Alliance. They do like the BX plugins mm-hmm. and various other ones. Um, if you they they seem to have a lot of sales. So if you keep an eye on their plugins, they'll be down from like three hundred dollars to thirty or whatever. So I've just been that's snap- logical. I've just been yeah. No, I've, <laughs> I've just been snapping a bunch of them up as they come up. So there, there's a bunch on there I like. Um, uh, I mean, it's more like EQs and compressors. They do like an SSL channel. There's a Neve channel, and they they have really nice EQs in them, um, nice filters, um, and what else? Um, Event I do some nice stuff. Um, they do a reverb called Black Hole, which is um, oh, sounds cool. Yeah, it's really cool. It's it's kind of like an effect effect reverb. It's not like a normal reverb, but you can do like huge spaces with it if you turn it up. I like sort of if you play with the mix knob on that, you can go from mm-hmm. dry to really wet and do little effects and things. So that I'd recommend that one. I cool. like it. Mm. Amazing. There we go. We we'll need we we'll need to get him hooked up with Corey, who he works for Isotope, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Um, he's he, he's get, they're always looking for artists to basically test out stuff and things like that. So if yeah, I get the, I get the new Isotope Nine okay. suite there mm-hmm. as a beta test. So they've now released it though. Um, it's pretty good. I mean, yeah. the Isotope stuff's cool. Mm-hmm. So it's great for mastering tape yeah. emulators and I've never you know like I've never really used it to be honest. Though. All right, it's so one of the first ones I got way back. Mm. You know, um, when you're first starting out, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just to. I mean, try to start figuring out what mastering was all about, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, it was great. So it's Isotope 9, I think. So, Corey, when you watch this, hook, you know, hook a brother up. <laughs> so, what are the next moves then for, for Grum? The album's out, so right now it's just basically pushing all of that. But what other stuff you maybe got in the pipeline? Any remixes or other original content? Or are you the yeah. main focus here? Yeah, I mean, yeah, main focus is album at the moment. Um, I'm doing, I, I do a lot of edits for my sets, like, I mean, not just an edit. I mean, I do some remakes and things. I'll just make a track like how I would make it, maybe. So I did one of um, um, Monolink, Return to Oz. don't know if you've heard that one. Um, and I've, I've done one of um, RE's track from the last Dungeon Beats compilation. Uh, sorry, Alpha 9. Sorry, that's as serious. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm doing lots of these wee edits and things and playing them in my sets. So that's that's been quite fun. Um, but in terms of like official remixes, I'm doing one for uh, Paul Thomas at the moment. Um, of one of his tracks I've been playing a lot in the summer um, for his Future Sound of e- Egypt UV mm-hmm. um, so that I need to work on that when I go home actually <laughs> um, so that that's going to be coming up um, hopefully we'll do some more stuff with Zero Three as well nice. maybe do another They're remix or something brilliant label yeah Great I, did, label. I, did, I did that Mark Knight Colombian Soul one which did quite well yeah I've been um, playing that one ah cool that's no, brilliant thanks yeah yeah just the, the old riff like mm. love it yeah like, yeah just uh, because you've updated it it's like straight away mm. cool and <laughs> I mean that's that's definitely cool just having that ability maybe because the thing is you go out and because you get so much practice out there gigging yeah. you get to see what goes down well yeah. and what's not so do you think that energises you when you're going back to the studio and you think right I know that those three tracks really get a massive reaction I'm going to make something in that elk or does mm. that have any influence on your um, yeah, making yeah. yeah it's definitely you know it's the whole thing is this constant feedback <coughs> feedback loop of you know make tracks play the different tracks see what works and it comes back and then inspires me so mm. um, yeah you're constantly <coughs> thinking about these things because I know you've done a couple of re-edits and they usually go down quite well because it's the fusion of like two tracks people love or you're just mm. kind of doing it a wee bit in your own style you know or like something old school like a dead mouse but with something new in it or mm. something you know and it just it's very cool that's how versatile that's, you can be yeah I mean that's how you can make your sets um, stand out and be totally yours I think it's a good way to go Three bits of advice then, right? Let's do that. Mm. I like that. The three three questions a minute, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, for people that are up and coming or trying to put their stamp on the game, mm-hmm. right? Yep. How how do you break through through all the noise, firstly? How do you stand out? And what advice do you have to basically keep going? Um, I th- well, I, th- I think the, the thing I've always believed is you should always do what you think. You shouldn't, you know, in terms of coming up with music and what you want to make, do do what you like. Don't, don't try and follow something or you know if some genre becomes big like you don't need to jump on and do that just do what you like um it might take a little bit longer to get where you want to be but um you know that's how you i think nowadays it's good to 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 build um you know you can build a fan base around what you who you are and what you do and being original and being you and i think that's what people like to see nowadays um and uh, yeah you just 
stick to stick to your guns. Mm. Um, stick to your guns. Yeah. Have patience is yeah, essentially patience what you is, need. Yeah, patience is also essential, but. Um, yeah, it should be fun. It should be enjoyable. You do what you like. Make what you love. Fun's key. I think if it stops mm. being fun, yeah, that's what's the point? That's yeah. the Why point are you doing there. it? Yeah, you know, because you start it as a hobby, it should always be yeah. looked at that. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, you, you know? should always have fun doing it. I think that's golden for anyone really mm. though that are sticking out or beating their head against the wall because they're like, oh man, you know, my sound is going out of date or whatever. It's like mm. it's just listening to too much noise, isn't, isn't it? And you end up in that, you know, if you're true to yourself, you just keep doing what you love doing and the distractions just bounce off of that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think so. Too many cooks <laughs> <laughs> can spoil. Yeah. So Saturday then, we've got a big gig. We're all going to go along to it as well. Uh, SWG3, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yep. Should be good. Who else is on the lineup? It's, um, it's Transwax and Elan Bluestone. Yeah, and Juno Beats Night. That EP that came out, uh, Elan Bluestone... Spencer Brown mm. was it three tracker mm-hmm. you're loving that it's good isn't it yeah techno sort yeah. of techno y trancy techno yeah. just quite Enrico San Giuliano vibes off it I mm. thought one of the tracks Gatekeeper maybe I think it was very techno yeah. loved it loved think, that EP yeah I think Spencer is quite into his techno as well so I'm, I think that's yeah. shining through yeah. he's a brilliant artist yeah uh, amazing mm. um, have you met him before yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, done, we've done quite a lot of shows together from Andrew New Beats so. any tracks going to be working some music together maybe Maybe. I don't yeah. know. I think he's just I'll announced another, uh, another album. He's got like a second album coming out. So um, he'll be doing that for a while. But yeah, you never know. Never know. Never yeah. know. So yeah, we can. I can't wait to go Saturday. Saturday we'll be there. Mm-hmm. Yes, Good. looking forward to it. Also, Lange is coming over. Yep. Yes. Lange, the, yes. the legend that is. Nice. We're going oh, to try and get him on a podcast. I'll play... Um, I'll play some, maybe I'll play some lunch. Oh, and we'll, we'll surprise like him. <laughs> aye, aye, you should. Tell me you hear that. Yeah. <laughs> How are you hear that? Uh, like, follow lunch. me. Yeah. <laughs> Grumpy mix. Hear about that for God's sake. Yeah, not again. <laughs> <laughs> But that'll be cool. I mean, uh, the the old school meets the new school, so we'll take lunch for a wee night out in Glasgow, man. Hit the town. <laughs> definitely. Hit the town, man. Should be good fun, eh? Your rough heads on Sunday. Yep. Aye, definitely cool. So, should we wrap that up there? Yes. Thanks so much for coming yeah. on, Graham. Brian, um, thanks for having me. It's been a while, but we made it happen finally. Yep. Loads happening, so trips, please go and buy it. Don't don't illegally download this. <laughs> uh, we've got a physical copy, so thank you. Don't know where I, I don't know who's got a CD player anymore. But yeah, we'll find no, one nobody has one. <laughs> and it's sold out on vinyl as well, hasn't it? Um, I think by the time this goes up, it will have. Yeah, we were mm. down to the last few. So. Awesome man. Awesome. So if you do another run, I'm on one. Okay, we'll get as you I one. said, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it would be great to have one for the studio, wouldn't yeah. it? You know, just unopened Put it up on the wall yeah. unopened yeah. on the wall you know and again it's uh, like the we eye do. follows you around the room <laughs> <laughs> totally people come in for meetings and they're just kind of unnerved yeah. uh, but no again out. Grum Deep State new album just out show on Saturday so mm-hmm. well, we'll right. try and get this out as soon as possible this okay. episode mm-hmm. alright so wink, no wink. pressure no pressure <laughs> Eugenio uh, so hi right, episode 33 of the Escapade show Excellent. with Grum thanks very much Thank much you. appreciated thanks, guys. Yeah. till next time Goodbye. Let's do it.